Hello, and a very welcome back. Um, if you have been with us for most of today at this ISNTD climate and health event, for anybody who has just been joining us uh, in the last few minutes, my name is Marianne Comparet, and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases uh, on what is our annual event, looking a bit closer, shining the spotlight on those linkages between climate and health, but also climate and uh, more particularly diseases and neglected tropical diseases. Um, if you haven't been with us uh, over the course of the day, just to summarize very briefly, we heard a lot at the start, a very stark reminder that um, climate change represents, in essence, the biggest threat to health of the 21st century. Uh, we then, on a more positive note, heard about a lot of uh, improvements in climate services, in data. We saw some fantastic modeling work uh, linking climate data and health outbreak predictions or outcomes. Uh, and we've had a wonderful session just a few minutes ago looking at the major impact of the healthcare sector on climate change, particularly emissions and so forth, but also the huge opportunities that as a, as a sector, healthcare has in providing um, <clears throat> support, funding, uh, decarbonization and lots of um, really important avenues. So it certainly has been a very rich and varied day. And it's my absolute pleasure at the end of all this, um, where really the message we've been heard hearing has been about building those partnerships. It's my pleasure to welcome our last four, five speakers today, um, who will be broadening the lens uh, a bit further, not just looking at specific diseases and the role of climate, but looking at how engaging in fields as diverse as mental health, but also soil health, um, repellents and flood management uh, can help to Im improve the relationship between climate and health. So, Against this backdrop of all this context, it's my pleasure to welcome our speakers today. Um, I'll just go around the screen as I normally do, uh, just as it appears on my side. I hope it's it's the same for you. So on, on my right, it's a great honor to welcome Professor Kishore Wassan and John Paul Wassan. Nice to have you with us. Hi. Uh, Professor Wassan, you are the co-founder and co-director of the Neglected Global Diseases Initiative at the uh, University of British Columbia. And John Paul Wassan, you are at the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we'll also hear from Dalali Manto. Welcome, Dalali. Thank you. Hi, you're joining us from the Global Health Institute at Merck. Yes. Thank you very much. And... Uh, Welcome to Talia Principe. Hi, Leah. Hello. Uh, you will be speaking to us about research that was undertaken uh, whilst you were at the Department of Public Health at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. And currently you are moving on to being a postdoctoral researcher in public health um, at Leiden University. Thanks for being with us. And it's also a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Churchill Tabowe. Hello, Churchill. Yeah, hello, how are you kind of, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tavoe, you. you are um, <clears throat> NTD's program coordinator at the Bayelsa State in Nigeria. And, <clears throat> excuse me, which I believe does not do justice to the incredibly vast, varied and uh, numerous programs and projects that you are running in this state and particularly following the devastating floods that were experienced in 2022 and we'll be hearing a lot more about that so to our five speakers thank you so much for being with us welcome uh welcome as well to our online audience karina mondragon shem welcome eureka sakai Catherine brown um gasu kalibali welcome to everyone just to name a few and so without any further delay, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Kishore Wassan and John Paul Wassan to uh, share with us some very original and um, important research on the effects of climate change on soil health 
and how this impacts neglected tropical diseases. Well, thank you very much for having us, Marianne. And it's always an honor and pleasure to present at ISNTD. And, uh, um, and we also want to uh, uh, dedicate this presentation in the memory of Cameron, who has been uh, an amazing, uh, amazing champion of ISNTD. Um, and obviously, uh, Marianne, to you and your family. So with that, um, uh, my name is Kishore Wasson. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and co-director of, in, of uh, the Neglected Global Diseases Initiative at the University of British Columbia. And with me is my colleague and by chance, my son, John Paul Wasson, who is a soil scientist at the University of Saskatchewan. And today we have kind of an unusual and interesting presentation uh, for our audience today, which is the effects of climate change on soil health and the impact on global spread of NTDs. And particularly the focus is on the role of soil science and collaborations with lab management. So with that, I'll pass it over to John Paul to talk about the first part of the presentation. John Paul. Alrighty, yeah. So, you know, we've been hearing throughout today, today about how uh, climate change is increasing uh, temperature, humidity, precipitation, and how this is expanding the role, uh, the range of vectors and NTDs. But, you know, climate is not the only determinant of uh, vector and NTD establishment. There are other factors at play. Uh, there's a uh, human influence. So how the land is being used, is it agricultural? Is it urban? Uh, the transport of these diseases, uh, through shipping, for example, and uh, if the uh, ecosystem is very disturbed, you can imagine if uh, all the insects in an area were killed off, it would be easier for uh, a mosquito vector, for example, to establish. Um, another thing that's important to remember is that these vectors are, are living organisms, and some of these NTDs are living organisms, and they have their own uh, natural predators and, and, and pathogens. And so when they move into a new range, are they uh, able to... Um, are they escaping those enemies or are they uh, facing uh, uh, new enemies in these areas? And so if they are facing new enemies, they're introduced with uh, their old enemies and they may not establish very well. But uh, if they're able to escape their natural predators, you can imagine uh, this is a worst case scenario where they're able to uh, proliferate in the environment. And finally, uh, what I want to talk about most today is, is the hydrology. And so how does the precipitation actually interact um, with the surface? Because it, it may or may not necessarily uh, cause standing water, flooding, runoff, all these uh, concerns we have with NTDs. It depends on uh, the properties. And so the idea that I want to propose to you today is that the soil environment can be understood as a, a mediator between those uh, climatic, human, and biotic factors. And so what, is, uh, what might that uh, look like then? So what are some factors then that may be related to uh, NTDs and vectors? So in the case of, of soil transmitted helminths, um, Things like what is the soil temperature and, and the moisture content at that egg or, or larval stage versus the, the runoff that's being experienced. So can they, the eggs be transmitted into water bodies? Um, in terms of mosquito vectors, um, having lots of standing water, eutrophication, temperature, things that will facilitate the, the breeding and, and the larval development. And sometimes the soil itself may actually be the source of the NTDs. So, for example, uh, podoconiosis is this form of lymphoderma that causes swelling in the legs and feet, um, uh, mainly among uh, barefoot uh, farmers. And it's because of the weathering of this unique volcanic rock that's releasing these uh, irritating minerals and causing the disease. So there is a link between the, the soil factors and uh, the spread of these, these NTDs. And so we need to, it's really important to consider novel approaches. And all day you've probably been hearing about these novel approaches. And so the second idea that I want to introduce is not just soil as a mediator, but uh, soil health. So in ecology and agriculture, we understand healthy soils to be those that provide uh, benefits and services like biodiversity, water quality, agricultural uh, production. But the idea that we've been working on for a little while is is it possible that healthy soils also prevent the spread of NTDs? And like public health, 
can we improve and manage our soil health um, for this objective? And so uh, for the rest of my section, I wanna talk about some management techniques that uh, may help uh, address the spread of NTDs in these novel ranges under climate change. And so the first factor here talking about uh, dealing with uh, standing water. Um, so standing water, you know, maybe is due to a few factors. One is where the groundwater table is sitting on the, the soil surface. So the dashed line in the figure here um, represents where the water is sitting uh, in the soil profile. And then you can see there's this dip in the landscape. And then that, that dip um, is where the water is, is most likely um, to accumulate. And so these are going to be our areas of risk uh, when we're talking about uh, standing water or um, uh, flash flooding occurring, and they can be quite variable. And uh, another big concern is, is how the water is actually moving through the soil. So in the left uh, pole out here, you can see some uh, rectangles, and those are meant to represent um, the clays which are present in the soils. And typically there's a very high clay content in uh, tropical soils. And um, you can imagine if they're all stacked together like that, it's very difficult to have downward water movement. It has to go back and forth, side to side. And it's these areas that are going to be the highest risk um, for uh, flash flooding, for um, a precipitation and runoff, because they don't have the ability to deal with that increased uh, intensity and, and, and frequency of uh, precipitation. And, so, for example, we might see something uh, like this uh, water body here where it seems very flat, but because of either the soil properties or where the groundwater table is sitting, uh, we have some standing water on the surface. So what can we do about it? Well, um, we can plant uh, deep rooted vegetation. So what that would do is uh, suck that water down. Um, it would in, in create uh, more uh, pores or holes um, in the soil that allow for downward movement. And it would allow that this particular area on the landscape um, to uh, better react um, to um, increased precipitation. So increasing that, that downward movement with this uh, vegetation. Um, another major concern with, you know, NTDs, of course, is, is water quality and drinking water quality. And so I mentioned eutrophication previously, and eutrophication is the elevated nutrient levels in a water body. And these uh, can stimulate the breeding um, and the development of NTDs or vectors, so for example, mosquitoes. And um, this often is due to runoff, uh, carrying manure, fertilizers, organic matter into that water body. Um, and then another thing with water quality is that same runoff can also transport diseases. I mentioned uh, helminths uh, previously and other vectors um, into that water body where they accumulate and, and get into the drinking water. And so two, uh, two concerns here. So how can we manage that? Um, we can try to control it um, at the source. And so you can see here this river, there's a lot of uh, vegetation um, alongside it, you can see the diversity of shrubs and, and trees and such. And what this vegetation here at the, uh, at the edge can do is actually provide uh, filtration uh, because of the deep root system. And that filtration can uh, stop the runoff of those uh, organic contaminants of the water. It can slow the movement of perhaps some of those diseases and those vectors um, into the water. And um, we call this uh, a riparian area. And uh, we can do a similar thing actually in agriculture. Uh, these are called buffer strips. And again, similar idea, you plant those deep rooted plants that are able to buffer um, against uh, the movement uh, into uh, the water. And this is also uh, agriculturally uh, very important as well because it helps make sure that uh, those nutrients remain on site and available for the crops that the farmer is growing. So uh, both ways, it's, it's very helpful. And if you go back to the previous image I was showing you, you can note now, you see that there's a dramatic difference in the amount of vegetation that's around the water body. And why is that? Well, it's actually in this image because of heavy livestock use. Uh, the livestock have really targeted the vegetation at this water body. And so you can imagine then if we had um, 
uh, vegetation here, like in the left image, um, there would be much less risk. So it's not just necessarily the inherent characteristics or even the vegetation we have on the landscape, but how we manage the landscape and how we use the landscape. And so if we can modify how we use the landscape, if we know that there's going to be a risk, um, that is a great opportunity. And the last thing I want to talk about here is soil mapping. So these soil properties, as I've been mentioning, are highly variable. And it's really important to have um, detailed maps, just like when we having those detailed maps of endemic diseases, for example, um, it, we can have detailed maps of soil properties. And so you can see in this image, just in the span of a few kilometers, we can have quite diverse um, soil properties. And some of those areas are gonna be higher risk um, for flooding, for runoff than uh, other areas. And so having that, that information um, is very critical and it's not always available in um, every part of the world. And uh, for example, in the case of poniconiosis, as I was talking about for many years, having that limited mapping was a challenge in, in uh, managing the disease because it was difficult to identify this, the, the areas of greatest concern. And so to wrap up this idea of managing soil, um, we can understand the soil as this mediator between the factors, and we can promote the health of our soil to limit the spread of NTDs and vectors. But, and this is where we transition, you know, the land management can't work alone, right? It's not going to be this strategy that work alone. We have to try to limit um, the available habitat for these vectors and these diseases, but we also need to have effective and accessible treatments uh, for NTDs. And that is not my area of expertise, but uh, it is Dr. Lausanne's area of expertise. So I'll turn over the presentation to him. Well, thank you very much, John Paul. Um, in the last five minutes of the presentation, and I'll go very fast, um, I want to build on what John Paul is saying, is that it's all, all obviously a multifactorial, multidisciplinary strategy that we need in order to be able to be able to understand how climate change is affecting the spread and the propagation of NTDs, and then develop strategies to be able to address that from a drug development perspective. So from a drug development perspective, as, as we've already heard from many talks today, the influence of increasing temperature, precipitation and flooding, humidity, insect infestation, but two other aspects that I think is really important that we have to take into account. Number one is the increase in violent storms, which damage infrastructure so that if you're trying to get um, a drug out to people in, the, in rural communities, um, they may not have the medical facilities because it's been damaged because of violent storms as a result of climate change. And finally, as John Paul has mentioned, um, altered soil environment influencing the impact of precipitation and insect infestation is critical. Thus, we need to develop drug formulations and drug delivery systems that are cost-effective, safe, tropically stable, and accessible, requiring minimal healthcare personnel for administration so that we are able to have a, a robust dr drug that can overcome the effects of climate change on these aspects of drug delivery. So earlier today, you heard a great presentation about leishmaniasis in Europe as being an epidemic. And um, th this is actually quite interesting. In fact, at the American Society of Tropical Medicine meeting in Chicago a few weeks ago, uh, they announced about cutaneous leishmaniasis potentially being an epidemic in the United States, which is actually quite, quite interesting. Um, and they actually indirectly uh, thought that that might have to do with climate change, that that now environments in the southern United States um, are now ripe for um, the sand fly, which leads to leishmaniasis. So in my last two or three minutes, I just want to give you a case of what we've done um, to develop a drug delivery system that's robust against climate change for NTDs. Uh, in the case of leishmaniasis. So leishmaniasis, I'm not going to go in detail, is a devastating disease. Uh, the sand fly comes along and stings you, releases a parasite that can spread into the liver or the spleen and lead to different forms of, of leishmaniasis, the cutaneous form on your skin and the more systemic form, visceral leishmaniasis, that can lead to, that can lead to death. And this is really a real, real world efficacy problem problem. And in fact, in the regions of the world where we see leishmaniasis on this map, if I show you the next slide, if you overlay that to changes in temperature and changes in humidity and precipitation, you can see 
that the pattern is very, very similar. So these are ripe areas because of climate change has led to ripe areas of leishmaniasis. So we've developed, of course, amphotericin B is one of the mainstays in the treatment of uh, bloodborne fungal infections and parasitic infections. However, the major problem with amphotericin B, it's got low solubility and permeability. It's got low oral bioavailability. It has to be given as a parenteral administration, as an IV infusion. And the problem with that is that it may not be cost effective. Um, there are side effects from the infusion. Um, it's not accessible. And the, one of the main formulations that is being used parenterally is not tropically stable. Uh, it is also a very effective drug in the treatment of many systemic fungal infections, secondary to um, a weak immune system. I uh, won't talk about that today, but this, th this drug has got widespread use. The current treatments for leishmaniasis are liposomal AMP B, miltefacine, and paramomycin, and each has their own safety or limitations. The liposomal AMP B, you have to give it parenterally, as I mentioned, and it's not cost effective or tropically stable, but very, very effective. It's the accessibility of getting that drug to people in rural communities. Miltefacine is the only oral product on the market for the treatment of BL. But the problem is its toxicity potential, as well as drug resistance, as well as its formulation stability. It breaks down in very humid climate change environments. Paramomycin is a, is a toxic aminoglycoside that has accessibility problems, and you have to give these painful IM injections. So if we could develop a cost-effective, safe, tropically stable, accessible formulation um, that could address the limitations of parenteral use, this could be a major, major thing. Um, and this is where the opportunity of developing an oral formulation of amphotericin B came, came into place. And here are some of the benefits of having an oral amphotericin B. It's easy to administer at home, decrease in the cost of administration, the lack of infusion side effects, the lack of kidney, liver, and GI toxicity, increased accessibility, and it's thermally stable. We can take the medication to people in the rural communities and increase drug adherence. And I'm not going to go through all this data in these last two slides, but just for our, just to show you, we have developed an oral formulation of amphotericin B that's cost effective, that's safe, that's tropically stable, that's accessible, and we have positive human phase 1A and phase 1B data now that we're presenting here. And just yesterday, and this is a very important announcement, the WHO through their PADO group have announced that um, oral amphotericin B is on their priority list for, for development in the treatment of leishmaniasis in children. Um, that report just came out yesterday. And, uh, and of course, some of the work that we've done has been cited in that report. And moving forward, we hope to have an oral formulation of AMP-E that addresses the issues of, of climate change uh, that comes, comes about because of climate change. That's a robust formulation that can be given accessibly to people with VL in the developing world. Um, I'm not going to go through these last two slides about the safety and the importance and advantages of our oral AMP-E. I've already mentioned that. Um, but I will turn it back to uh, John Paul for an overall conclusion of our of our short presentation. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. So again, we the ideas that we we've been presenting today. You know, it's important to have um, these novel approaches as we're dealing with climate change. And so, um, one novel idea we've presented today is the soil environment as a critical mediator. And this idea of how healthy soils and conversely unhealthy soils can aggravate um, the spread of NTDs under climate change. And number three, how there are these opportunities to manage our land um, to achieve these healthy soils that can reduce the suitable range for NTDs. But that has to be a multifaceted approach um, with, as you just heard, these cost-effective, tropically stable uh, drug formulations. And so, you know, it's um, important, I think, to have these, uh, you know, unique, um, uh, maybe interdisciplinary partnerships. So perhaps with somebody you weren't uh, previously thinking of, perhaps you didn't think of hearing a agriculture talk today, um, but uh, there are a lot of great opportunities here to take unique approaches to manage uh, NTDs. So thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present here today, and uh, we're happy to take uh, uh, any uh, questions. Thank you so much. Just
turn. Thank you very much, John Paul and Kishore. Um, this session is about expanding those partnerships around the climate and health nexus, looking at uh, unique approaches, multi-sectoral uh, approaches, but also multidisciplinary. And I just really wanted to thank you. As you say, you've brought in the agricultural um, uh, angle on this. You've all, we've also looked at drug discovery and that all important focus on pediatric formulations that you mentioned with some very exciting news. So uh, this is going to be an amazing session <laughs> where we bring it all together and really uh, cover those many different partnerships that all can leverage um, this very complicated relationship between climate and diseases, particularly neglected tropical diseases. So thank you so much for that. And there is no uh, discussion of climate and diseases without mentioning vector-borne diseases. And so our next speaker, Delali Mantov, um, will be talking to us a little bit more about um, tackling malaria and the impact of climate on this vector-borne disease, but also the opportunities that are offered uh, by using and developing repellents. And so without any further delay, I hand over to you, Delali. Um, I'm just going to start your slides. There we go. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity from ISNTD for giving us the um, chance to share some insights on the work we do at Global Health and how a partnership we have with um, different stakeholders can um, address malaria prevention in the event of climate change and the consistent increase in the numbers of mosquitoes or vector-borne diseases and the impact that they have. Um, so briefly, I'll take us through um, a short talk. Maybe I'll, I'll give you a, some insights about who we are as Merck um, and specifically also um, talk about the unit to which I belong, which is the Global Health Unit and how we approach um, vector-borne diseases, specifically malaria, because that's our therapeutic, of, therapeutic area of interest and also give some insights on how climate change is increasing the numbers of vector-borne diseases, specifically mosquitoes, and um, increasing the numbers and the global distribution of mosquitoes to places where previously there were no um, evidence of mosquitoes there. Then finally, and most importantly, I share with you the work we're doing with our repellents, repurposing it to address um, malaria and its effect on the Anopheles mosquito um, that causes malaria. Okay, next slide. So we are Merck and we've been around for more than 350 years. Um, we are present in over 66 countries and each and every day is more than 60,000 people um, work uh, astutiously to provide um, sustainable solutions in science and technology to improve the lives of humans in the world. Um, so our business is along three lines. We have the healthcare business, which is basically um, our biopharmaceutical um, business, which provides innovative medicines for general diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and specific diseases such as um, cancer and immunological diseases. We also have our life science business, um, which is responsible for providing tools that empower researchers to do their work effectively. And we have the electronic business of Merck that provides high-tech materials, um, solutions to, to the world. Um, so everywhere else in the world, we are referred to as Merck. But when you go to the United States, we are referred to as EMD Serono for our healthcare business, Millipore Sigma for our life size business, and EMD Electronics for our electronics business. So what do we do at the Global Health Institute? Uh, our basic mandate is to address the global health challenges of tomorrow by, by acting today. So basically, we act on three fronts, and it's evident um, that 
three major challenges will face the world in the near future. And we try to address the challenges that come with these, um, with these, with these events. So first and foremost, there would be water scarcity in the very near future. So it's estimated that close to 40%, um, there will be a close to 40% gap in the need for water, even by 2030, which is staggering. And um, it is also said that most likely the next world war will be caused by water scarcity. Um, we also address major problem, major population growth, um, which will lead to an increase in inequalities, basically in health resources and that lead to migration. And for today's topic, we address vector-borne diseases and what climate change is doing to trigger the new spread of vector-borne diseases to new areas and also increasing the numbers. It's estimated by, that by 2050, 50% 50 of the world's population will be exposed to mosquitoes, which is something that is extremely scary. So our, our, our mandate at Global Health Institute under the Global Health um, Unit of Merck is to address challenges that affect millions of people. Our focus is basically in the low and middle income countries and we try to improve the health of underserved populations in these places by employing Merck's science and technology solutions and innovations um, to these problems. And we always do this in partnership with others. Um, like I said, in our focus area or therapeutic focus area is in malaria. And we try to approach um, our fight in malaria through either prevention and control of malaria worldwide. We do this in an integrated approach um, on four fronts. Basically, we address treatment uh, by trying to come up with drug discoveries and clinical developments for new antimalarials, which are currently developing in the Institute. We try to strengthen the health systems of the various um, health systems that are that we work the countries that we work in we try to strengthen the health system and we do various programs um, in in the in the area of diagnosis when it comes to we try to um, increase the capacity of healthcare workers to diagnose malaria and other diseases uh, much more efficiently and today I will also talk about our prevention arm where we try to repurpose our insect repellent to address malaria. So just to give some insights into um, the increasing risk of malaria spread um, from climate change, um, we see this happening in three fronts. Um, if you look at the, the map to your left and the red portions, these are areas that in the near future would experience malaria and mosquito-borne diseases. There are enough less malaria that causes mosquito-borne diseases. So the increasing rise in temperatures caused by climate change would make these areas more suitable for mosquitoes to breed and, um, and survive and be sustainable in these areas. So the increasing um, temperatures is always a threat to the increase in spread of malaria and mosquito-borne diseases. Also, with the erratic and increased rainfall patterns, uh, this would leave standing water available for mosquitoes to breed um, in areas, in much more larger areas, and also with increased droughts that are happening, um, standing water in areas where there are previously lakes or ponds uh, will be prone to um, malaria and mosquito breeding sites. Also, the warmer climates would also definitely extend the transmission disease transmission season. So there'll be a prolonged disease transmission um, period where people become success susceptible to infection. Also, we've noticed that the change in temperatures or the rise in temperatures are affecting the biting behaviors of mosquitoes. So previously, the Anopheles mosquito, which tend, tend to bite 
um, late in the evenings have now started to bite earlier in the evenings or just before sunset. And this drastically calls for more preventive tools um, for personal uh, protection of people since the current um, tools are geared towards, um, let's say, indoor protection of um, people where mosquitoes previously were known to um, bite at a, a later time of the day. Okay, next slide. So that leads us to um, a project we started to run in Ghana um, on our insect repellent IR3535. So IR3535 has been developed by Merck for close to 40 years. It's not a new product. It, um, it's been basically used in Western um, countries for people to protect themselves when they go into the woods and camp, when they go for camping on hikes uh, and other such related activities. Um, we've done various efficacy studies and it has demonstrated efficacy against the vectors that cause Zika, Dengue, chikungunya and Lyme disease. So it's effective even against the Aedes mosquito that causes Zika. But our studies on the base IR3535 show that it had limited efficacy against the Anopheles mosquito that causes malaria. So through partnerships, we work together with um, another organization who has um, a formulation um, of IR3535, who was able to reformulate IR3535 in a formulation with their patented um, technology to increase the repellency of IR3535, decreasing the absorption and decreasing the repellency rates of IR3535. So we thought it wise that why don't we try this IR3, this new formulation of IR3535 against the Anopheles mosquito that causes malaria um, in, in an endemic country, um, in both the lab setting and both, and also in the um, real life setting. Um, just to add, IR3535 is safe, has a safe profile for use in humans. It's eco-friendly and it's also, like I said, friendly to use in, um, non-toxic to use in humans of all ages. So we chose to do our study in Ghana. Why Ghana? Because Ghana is a endemic with uh, malaria all year round. Um, the entire population is at risk of malaria. Uh, in 2021, close to 20% of the population um, was infected with malaria and there were about 12,000 deaths. We chose Ghana also because there is a strong commitment from the government and the National Malaria um, Control Program, now the National Elimination Control Program, in the fight against malaria. So being that there has been a shift from control of malaria to elimination of malaria. So there is strong support for um, new solutions, added solutions to the already, exist already existing solutions that are available in the fight against malaria. So we thought it wise to do our study in Ghana. So like I said, um, this work was done not just by Merck, but it was a partnership between three partners. Um, and the objective of this study was to establish the efficacy of the, the new formulation of IR3535 against the Anopheles mosquito, both in the lab and in a local setting in the country. So as Merck, we provided the base material, provided quality checks, safety and regulatory expertise, and provided malaria expertise, and most importantly, the financial backing to do this study. We worked together with Noguchi Memorial Institute, which is a world-renowned WHO center for testing of repellents, and it's internationally recognized uh, worldwide and also has partnerships with the Ministry of Health and the National Malaria Control Program. And we worked with a partner, LIFO, who holds the IP for this new formulation. Last year, I was here and I presented the lab laboratory results of um, this promising formulation. And as expected, we had positive results 
of um, this product in the lab setting where we, we test it in an arm and cage study. And this year we moved to a field study where the repellent is tested in real, in real time in, on, on humans in the field as it would be used. So now let me just share briefly the study design that was used. Um, we tested over 16 days um, between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. This repellent um, on 16 um, volunteers or technically trained uh, people to test this IR3535 formulation in the in the natural setting. So every day between over 16 days between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. they tested they exposed their lower limbs like you can see uh, on the on the picture below they sit they sit outside the hut and in one inside the hut and apply uh, a specific amount of the IR3535 on their lower limbs and sits in the elements over the period of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. and do what we call human landing collections on, on the exposed um, limbs, on their exposed lower limbs. So in this period, over the um, nine hours that is tested, they try to catch uh, mosquitoes that are landing on their legs. And here we test for, we, we have metrics that we, we, we assess. We, we assess the repellency percentage of the repellent. We are also analyze the biting rate that the mosquitoes have to the exposed legs and to a control with, and the control is um, just uh, placebo, which is alcohol. And we also try to determine the entomological rate, which is the effective rate of the mosquitoes that land on the exposed limbs. We also try to establish if there is a presence of resistant species in, in the air testing area to establish if this repellent will be effective against um, resistant species should they be present in an area you're using it. So we are encouraged and happy to share that we had significantly good results in this field study um, on point one, which shows a graph of the percentage repellency over the nine hours, it shows that for the participants or the technicians that applied the IR3535 on the exposed limbs, there was close to, there was a hundred, between a hundred percent repellency. That's a complete repellency of the IR3535 and 96% repellency of the IR3535. This is extremely encouraging um, data that we have. We also did an analysis to show the biting rate of people that are exposed to both the control group, which use just alcohol as a control or a placebo, and IR3535. And we're excited to share that the control group had um, over 16 bites per person per night and IR3535 gave a protection that provided only 0.59 bytes per person per night. We went ahead to do um, the sporozoid rate, to measure the sporozoid rate, thereby um, have an indication of the entomological rate or the rate of um, infection that um, a mosquito can have when it bites a person um, that is not protected in the community. So this gave um, for people who are not under control, under the protection of IR3535, it would give an entomological rate of 24 bytes or an effective rate of 24 bytes per person per year. So that means a person would be exposed to 24 different infections in a year or two infections in a month, which is very, very significant. And IR3535 for the mosquitoes collected, gave negative um, malaria sporozoids, given that given the um, implication that there was a hundred percent, or there were no, there was no possibility of a bite per man per year to be infected. So what does this mean? So this means that um, our study shows 
there would be significant reduction in biting rate due to the extended repellency of the product over the nine hours that um, we did the study. And this could provide the potential for complete protection of infective bites, even in resistant dense areas, because uh, people will be completely protected from the bites. And also the sporozoid ratio uh, zero in, um, in the, in the, in the um, people who used um, the IR3535, protecting them from uh, resistant um, bites of malaria. So we are sure and we are encouraged that IR3535 has the potential to be an addition to as a strong personal protection tool against vectors, especially in emergency settings caused by uh, climate changes, such as flooding, where people are exposed to the elements, uh, the elements of uh, the, the of the environment, uh, they have a protective tool to protect them against malaria. Even in in areas where there are earthquakes or wars, people have such a tool to protect themselves against the elements when they're exposed to it. So this is a, a clear example of where a public-private partnership has provided a potential to for to address um, today's tomorrow's problem today. Um, so that is the end of my presentation, and I will be happy to take questions should they pop up. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Marianne. Uh, Dadali, congratulations to yourself, to the whole team at Merck, at Liverpool. Liverpool at Noguchi Memorial Hospital and just more widely at, at the Merck Group team uh, for these incredibly positive results. Uh, you mentioned you presented last year and this is definitely a project that we've been tracking and we had no doubt it would be successful, but some of those uh, figures that you presented in terms of the drop in bites are hugely impressive and an immense addition to this toolkit that we're talking about in this session. How can it be expanded to really affect those climate sensitive diseases? So thank you very much. That was amazing. We are going to be talking about flooded areas as well in a few moments. So that will be uh, really brilliant. So thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, before we move on to um, the talk by Dr. Churchill Tavoy, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Leah Principe. Hi, Leah. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was hiding here. We're very grateful that you've joined our session, Leah. You are going to be talking to us about climate distress climate sensitive risk factors and the mental health amongst Tanzanian youth. Great. As Marian mentioned, my name is Leah Principe. I'm going to be presenting a paper that was hot off the press, just released at Lancet Planetary Health. And it's looking at measures of climate distress, climate sensitive risk factors and associations with mental health in uh, Tanzanian youth. So I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this slide because I think we all are here for a reason. Uh, the idea that climate change is cited as the largest threat to global health in the 21st century and the Lancet, but also um, in day-to-day -day life, you can see uh, uh, in social media, in the news, you see all of the people kind of crying out about this crisis. And, uh, but, but at the same time, we have this, you know, uh, wealth of information of, of young people getting out there on the streets and talking about this. There's still very relatively uh, low amounts of research related to the impacts of climate change on mental health. Uh, so these gaps in the evidence are really acute in the global south. And, uh, you know, most studies are from the global north, and we don't have a lot of perspectives from people who are living on the front lines of climate change and how it's impacting their mental health. So that was like a big motivation for the study in general to really get into a under uh, um, a, a, a population that their voice isn't being heard. So, and then lastly, I mean, the idea of focusing on adolescents and young people, um, you know, it's 
really crucial because mental health disorders place a huge burden on their well-being. Uh, it has lasting consequences, not only in the immediate, but throughout their lives. Uh, mental disorders can be persistent, they can be debilitating, uh, and they also can be tra uh, transferred to future generations. So it's really important to kind of address these issues among young people uh, as quickly as possible. So let's see. Okay, so uh, the research on climate change and mental health, they, there's a, many kind of frameworks on how climate change can impact mental, mental health. And I'm giving a very, very brief summary, so I apologize, but I just wanna give you a kind of an idea of what m most of the frameworks kind of focus on. So there are the direct effects on mental health. So a good example would be when you have an acute or a, a large extreme weather event, uh, floods, hurricanes, any kind of large uh, uh, natural event uh, leading to a stress response or a trauma response that in turn is, uh, you know, uh, affecting people's mental health. And then there are indirect effects. So again, you have this physical exposure to some sort of climate event, and it could be even subacute event like droughts or heat waves. And these affect the social determinants of mental health. So by uh, reducing access to food, to water, to affecting people's livelihoods, these conditions uh, may in turn uh, impact mental health. And then this last one is commonly referred to as this overarching uh, issue. So this overarching concern of climate change leading to these negative climate related emotions. So you I'm sure have run across a lot of terms like climate anxiety and eco-anxiety. And this field of research is among the three, probably the newest and the, the least understood, because at the same time, these negative emotions are stressors. They're also kind of natural responses to a threat and should not necessarily be uh, made into a, a diagnostic or pathologized. Being anxious about climate change is kind of a natural reaction to a threat. But understanding how these negative emotions can infect, can impact mental health is something that's kind of a new field of research. So, so we decided to do the study in Tanzania and uh, I'll give a very brief overview of the study design. So basically we had this uh, large longitudinal evaluation that was conducted in Aringa and Mbeya uh, regions of Tanzania. And about 2,500 adolescents were interviewed for this evaluation in 2017. And at the time, uh, in order to be eligible, they were 15 to 19 years old and enrolled in a social protection program, basically meaning that they were living at or below the extreme poverty line. So this program really targeted uh, the ultra poor in the country and still does. It's a, a national uh, intervention. And so for this study, we included all young people who were re-interviewed in 2021, and, and we ended up uh, doing quantitative surveys where all of the instruments were translated and piloted in Swahili, and the interviews were done in face-to-face -face settings and in these rural communities. So our mental health outcome that we used for this study was uh, we used the de depression. We referred to depression throughout the uh, um, article and depression was defined as having a 10 or higher on the Center for Epi Epidemiological Studies depression scale 10 item uh, version of the scale and it has been this scale has been validated in African context also in Tanzania among young African uh, Tanzanians and um, also we I just want to clarify that we use a binary indicator in this analysis so basically when it when the CSD 10 is higher or equal to 10, that is indicative of a youth exhibiting depressive symptomatology. Basically what I'm trying to say is it's not in itself a diagnostic measure, but it's been used to, to uh, you know, indicate clinical re clinically relevant levels of depressive symptoms. So for climate change measures, this was kind of a done, of course, everything was done in, in working among many people uh, in Tanzania and also colleagues, uh, other co-authors. Co uh, but we started off with just kind of asking, we, we didn't understand uh, exactly what to expect when we're going into these very rural areas. So we first just started with a question about 
how much they know about uh, climate change. Uh, and this was a question taken from Gallup World Poll because we wanted to get a kind of an understanding of, you know, where uh, these young people were in their understanding of even the terminology. And we had the options were never heard of it, know something, or know a great deal about climate change. And we, for many of our analyses, we dichotomized this just to basically say, the young person is aware of climate change or not aware of climate change. And this is referring to the terminology, if they're aware of the term. But with the understanding that some of these young people may not actually be familiar with the term of climate change in Swahili, but they may be aware of uh, the situation, they may be experiencing climate change, uh, we wanted to make a really inclusive measure of climate change distress. So we asked them, how distressed are you about changing weather patterns uh, and changing seasons? And the idea was instead of using the Swahili term and using instead a definition of climate change, even young people who maybe aren't familiar with the terminology, uh, but are experiencing climate change can, uh, you know, report on their feelings about the situation. And this uh, we had ranging from not at all to extremely. We dichotomized this for analyses to say if they were at all distressed versus not distressed. And we have some other measures here. We included youth characteristics, uh, basically to try and understand because it's an exploratory study, we don't really know what to expect. We wanna understand who young people are who are feeling distress. Uh, we wanna understand what kind of uh, indicators may predict their feelings of distress. And these indicators were also relevant in other studies looking at uh, climate change, uh, perceptions of climate change, perce perceptions of risk for climate change. So we kind of include them to understand uh, uh, you know, who is feeling distress over climate change. And then we also have uh, two categories of climate sensitive risk factors, trying to understand if young people who are at higher risk of poor outcomes, if climate change worsens or conditions worsen, so people who rely on farming for their income, uh, who are, you know, uh, have livestock. So the kind of uh, uh, livelihood activities that make people vulnerable to the effects of climate change, but also, uh, um, you know, could be uh, something that helps them get through climate change. Uh, these are just kind of um, uh, different kind of activities I think we found relevant. And then we have living conditions. So climate sensitive living conditions like food and water insecurity, uh, exposure to floods or droughts. So the idea is that, um, you know, people who are already food insecure are more likely to be vulnerable to climate change, but also climate change can cause people to be uh, food and water insecure. Okay, so I would say that our kind of main research question starting off was to try and understand if climate distress was related to worse mental health. So that's kind of like our our starting point for our research question. But we also wanted to understand if exposure or risk to climate events, so again, these uh, climate sensitive risk factors related to more climate distress. So if you rely more on the land for your living, are you more worried about climate change than uh, if you're not, if, if you're not living in uh, climate sensitive living conditions? And finally, we also want to understand uh, if these conditions were directly related to worse mental health. And there's some evidence already from many other uh, um, uh, researchers who found relationships between, for example, being food and water insecure and uh, having worse mental health. But again, these young people are people, they have, uh, uh, it depends where they live, their education level, their marital status, all these kind of different social and cultural and demographics are important for not only their mental health, but also potentially for their feelings of distress. And finally, climate awareness. Uh, it wasn't really our intention to focus on climate awareness specifically, but it did seem to be a very salient predictor of who was going to be distressed about climate, uh, the climate change. So basically, young people who were more aware of climate change tended to also be more distressed about climate change. So there's an obvious relationship where where people live, their education, um, you know, who they are predicts climate awareness as well as climate distress. 
And we did not find much evidence to show that those who are at our, our version of climate sensitive uh, risk factors, that they, they were more likely to be distressed about uh, climate change uh, generally for, for the most part. We did find that there was a relationship between living in conditions that are make people vulnerable, vulnerable to climate change and also conditions that uh, are potentially caused by climate change are more likely to be depressed. Uh, which again, that is, uh, you know, part of previous literature as well. So we kind of confirmed that. And finally, for our like main research question, the, what, we're, what we started off trying to understand, we did find that young people who were more distressed about climate change were also more likely to have depression, uh, according to our measure. And there's a lot more, but I'm glad I kept it short because I took so long to get this up. Uh, but I think that what really stands apart for this article, and I really hope that we continue to do more on, on this uh, subject, uh, because climate change and mental health studies almost exclusively look at one pathway. So in order for us to kind of think more about the larger impact of climate change, focusing only on, um, you know, major climate events and seeing how that impacts mental health is kind of ignoring the overarching uh, despair that's happening, uh, you know, on a global scale among young people. And focusing only on things like eco emotions kind of takes away from the people who are living, living it, you know, living in the front lines of climate change. So I think more, uh, one of the one of the like biggest takeaway messages is that uh, living in conditions worsened by climate change and feeling distress about climate change were both associated with worse mental health. So it's not just one pathway. Uh, and I think more research should really study the, the different pathways that can, that can lead to poor mental health among young people. And uh, populations living in the global south are the least represented in the literature. Uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, but the fact that we had these face-to-face -face interviews in remote settings uh, in a local language, I, I think it was really important to uh, uh, you know, reach these young people who are not really, uh, be, they don't have a platform. And finally, um, you know, there's a lot of debate in this new field of research where, you know, there's, there's no standardized measure. What is clim climate anxiety? What, are, what is a measure that really uh, captures how people are feeling? Uh, and, but the thing is that most of the existing uh, measures are validated and used in high resource settings, and they may not work for remote uh, or culturally diverse populations. They typically don't use more inclusive language. Uh, so they make the assumption that young people will be familiar with the terms like climate change. So it's really not reaching climate illiterate uh, populations. And then by using survey items that were translated, uh, they use inclusive phrasing. And um, I, I do think that that helped us to get a perspective from young people who really uh, may have varying levels of climate literacy, but it really just aren't in the literature. And I wanted to take a minute to acknowledge the evaluation we got the data from. All of these people were involved with helping us uh, collect the data. It was a very big operation. Uh, so it's not uh, just a small thing, to f what they uh, contributed. And finally, this I, have, I just want to point out, if anyone is interested in uh, climate change and, and health, um, I came across this book when I was doing my research for this paper, and this is a book by Van Vanessa Nakate, who you may be familiar with. She's a Ugandan climate activist, but she really discusses what it's like from an African perspective to be engaged with the climate activism community. She also gives a really uh, uh, readable and accessible overview of climate change and health in Africa, uh, so I highly recommend it, and I don't have any ties. <laughs> I just really want to use this platform to share her work, and hopefully more people will read about African perspectives. And that's it. If uh, there is a lot more in this paper, I highly recommend if you're interested to take a look at it. There's the link, and please, of course, contact me through my email, if anything. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly original piece of research and something that is clearly not being looked at enough. So thank you very much, Leah, and also for pointing out those gaps that are still outstanding, uh, giving us lots to think about. 
So it's my pleasure to hand over the floor now to our last speaker of this session, Dr. Churchill Toboe. Um, Dr. Toboe, your Neglected Tropical Diseases Programs Coordinator in the Bielsa State of Nigeria, and you'll be talking to us about your experience with perennial flooding and what this means in terms of impact on health facilities, but also vulnerable communities in Bayelsa State, and those really important partnerships that have been forged between the healthcare sector, the municipality, and the communities themselves. Thank you very much for joining us today, and over to you. Uh, good, good evening all, for Nigeria is evening now. I don't know, I should be in London time also. Uh, I'm speaking today on uh, perennial flooding and its negative effect on health facilities and the community dwellers. Actually, to adjust a preamble, by Nigeria really, the almost, uh, what I said, two third of Nigeria was highly flooded 2022 last year, precisely from October to uh, November. But uh, we, we also, we enjoy it negatively and positively because uh, I will speak out when, you no, know, when you're talking about enjoyment, so many factors come about it. We, we came out on it and we came on it. And apart from that, we, we enjoyed it fully. So let me go into the enjoyment part of it because we'll see every advent, every situation in life is always a point of trial and, and tribulations, people go through them. It's a scientific learning. And actually some of us will learn, we grew on it. Some persons also we lost some, some life. Now, the, just uh, the the quicking of it, the quicking of this introduction. Flooding always results. Next slide, please. Flooding always uh, uh, results in a displacement of communities, uh, dwellers, resulting overcrowding in some environment. Sometimes it can cause temporary crowding. Shelter is formed, what we call IGP camp, is being formed. And also that uh, some persons die in such conditions. Some persons don't even know how to swim. Migrants from different businessmen from different aspects of the, of the country, mainly in the southeastern region, they don't know how to swim mainly. So they come to Bayesa. Our area is mainly on mangrove. The, ma the mangrove, the rainforest zone. So it's just like it's a tradition. I could have shared that slide. It's a, a tradition for any person in the Zoland, mainly the South South. And when you are born, you dip into the water to learn how, after seven days, they teach you how to swim. It's after seven days of birth, they teach you and dip you, your mother must do that. It's like a ritual, those traditional rituals those days. But in vent of that, we come out with uh, physical traumas, it comes, and uh, in accident take place also, we have emotional distress, displacement and overcrowding in some environment. You have visitors, apart from reptiles, Visitors of sickness, and also some persons are coming from their homes, different immune system are coming to your place without plan. You must accommodate persons. And as they are coming to your home, they are moving for your move. Flood will invade your environment. They move to another environment. Some people will relocate almost a family, settled family, become visitors of about seven homes. Flood enter this home, they go to another place. That's how they are moving. And they are picking infections, different area to another. Before you come, before you go to the next stage, you might come down cholera, typhoid fever, hepatitis B, scabies, and diarrhea will might come up. Then we have almost all the flow in Baesa. We have 300 facilities, more than 300 facilities. All more of them were submerged. Only level one tertiary inside the Federal Medical Center in the state capital was standing. Apart from those areas, those, those local government were cut off. They were in high sea. With a place we call is at close to Atlantic Ocean. I have a shore. That, that local government, only one facility was there, and the headquarters had that. So flooding, really, we have communication, uh, we have contamination. We say it's a oil spillage in oil spill environment. So we have so many, so many hazards normally take place in that place. Water is pumping into the oil well, hydrocarbon spill, and snakes swim freely into homes and water logs. Next slide, please. Then uh, we have uh, background, really. In the background, I would just say we had about 500 IDP camps that was formed in the state. Having and those IDP camps, people were exposed to HIV, scabies, respiratory infection, and we have about 70 communities submerged in the water. You can see the way people were now living. Even our former president, President Jonathan Goodluck, was also submerged his home in his own town. He was living on top of Kenu. 
before he now moved to Abuja. So the federal capital. The state covered or recorded almost 1,000 drowns persons with multiple boat missiles. So it was just a pure, a pure disaster for the year. And that, that is, I say, it was negative impact and positive impact on it. Then the the about uh, 50 percent, 500 percent had cholera and diarrhea outbreak in the IDP camp. And uh, actually, there was no vaccine. The vaccine could not. There was no way even vaccine to flee into the state. The airport was cut off. The the road from other states was cut off. The two state area was now cut off from the other part of the world where the state, state was hanging value then. About 10 percent lost their life in that contaminated water during those drown. At least a little dry on the cholera outbreak. That is the time we now have it is discovered then that they had cholera outbreak that can cholera verbal cholera that can exist in salt water. In the early days of our research, we never had that research that verbal cholera can exist in salt water. So that was then. Schools were shut down for about three months. Children when I came out escaping about 300, as I said it already, 300 facilities were submerged. Snake, we saw different type of snake that was floating everywhere, flowing just like that. And you'll be swimming, you'll be moving, before you move your house, leave your house to where there's a, a little hill, hill, you must move through a water that will be at the chest level. When there's no boat to take you to that. So you must, it might jam snake. So people will move you, you see snake coming, you run back to your hand out. That's how it was. And for your village was everywhere flowing. The, the water was contaminated. Some those who had born old and water stand, water stand was also submerged by these were oils from the rigs. So it was just like people were not living. I saw it, I say it's negative and positive impact. Now impact uh, required by partners and health care professionals. Next slide please. Impact uh, required by health professionals and uh, partners on the negative impact of flooding in Vera on the vulnerable population. Vulnerable population aged and under age even those have uh, the age, those ones who do are not who never learned how to swim, they see vulnerable. Even those who are who learn how who know how to swim, it can also come down to different conditions. So do, we have op uh, operational research involving academias and CSOs. If people, if persons come down, just like came from other Paul and other speakers, knowing that we we had increased bite rate of mosquito at that period, and apart from that, we have high level of snake bites. Which are now flowing everywhere. Snakes were pushing free. as the flood comes up. Flow as the flood is entering into people's house. People are evacuating. Snake is also coming along with high speed into those into those homes. And snake in by the end of the early morning before you come out your window side. If you sleep, manage to have a deck, a deck inside the house, mosquitoes are really piled on the windows like bees. So you are moving. And you are, we are moving cops at that moment. People were just treating and treating to a point. We just let go. Let it be. So we have uh, issue of uh, we have issue of provision of IEC material, advocacy, radio jingles. People should be ready. Early warning about it, just like this time. This year there was no flood. This was on a natural standard of flood. It's not an abnormal type of flood. Want to say flood came, but people were able to manage the same. It was not take up the communities this year. It was a natural way of flooding coming to a period now level of flooding that came this year. So all of us, there was not much cry. But at this stage, people don't know the status of entities in the state. That is the condition. Because the last year, just like somebody spoke about soil being uh, uh, being polluted by flood, then picking into the environment. At this stage, soils transmitted uh, hermits, people don't know the status. And also the social emergency status, nobody knows now. Establishing for standard ITP camps across the state, having functional mobile clinic, there's, there, at that time, when they were IDP, they had just one, they had only one uh, mobile clinic that was in the form of boat. They were floating to one place. Uh, ambulance could not move because there was no way for it to move. Only the state capitals has one road, one road, one road from Federal Medical Center that could move that. And those multiple ITP camps, those 500 D camps, more than that, were scattered all over. So you see that uh, UNICEF were using plane, uh, helicopter to go and drop the relief material in those places as if in form of a uh, mobile clinic then and you know how expensive we could be costing a flight if, uh, an helicopter to uh, land and zibut in naira form it will be up to one million naira to or five hundred thousand naira to move one movement 
of, in, of helicopter to push material to that point. So early warning will also help and establishing standard clinic, mobile clinic in some of those uh, environments, building them above water level, if there will be a water level, because this last year came above all water projection on NEMA, SEMA standard was, NEMA, I don't know if you understand, National uh, Emergency Management uh, Agency. So all of them, what now the all projection was on all, all, all SEMA, NEMA, national and state level, all information they gave was submerged by flood. Information of flood could not stand out projections. So that is a timely evacuation of persons before and during the flood overflow. Establishment of river uh, ambulance. So at this stage, the state never suspected that last year flood, even Nigeria. So every person, no person who had that belief that the flood could get to that level. In some places, it's up to 10 feet on normal high level, 10 feet, no road level. So in the river level, in fact, just like a sea overcoming everywhere. Because coming from River Niger, uh, down from Sokoto Aro, from the northern side, and from River Benue, from, and also from Cameroon man, uh, flood, the river, it flows into the sea, and now flows back to the Atlantic Ocean. You know, uh, rotation of the moon have also effects on the, on the, on the, on the, on the Earth rotation has also effect on flooding. So that also we 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 that also had an effect in determining river flow, uh, ambulances and clinic provision of cholera cholera vaccine and biodegradable water recycling system. No, in uh, somebody were talking about that when you are doing about biodegradable water recycling system, you can recycle in type of water at any stage and make it portable. That would be another good project that will use to sustain flooded environments whereby they don't have any condition. You can have it very mobile, water recycling. When I was in UK, we had that in T-side, we had a project on that. And also training of health workers on emergency preparedness and vaccine uptake management. We have some persons, some health workers who are not really trained. To train or trainer is always there, but emergency preparedness is a recurrent material that health workers, when they are trained, they will to manage even those mosquito repellent they were talking that used in Ghana. They were to manage it during that period where the bite rate have increased. Because even this time, when water log is there, you cannot determine the season and period of bite rate in a day again. Because we have water locked everywhere, flooding, release mosquitoes from every side. Even mosquitoes, snake. Snake is almost vibrating everywhere now. If you have the best way to trap them in our place, it's using nets. Using nets, but mosquito uh, fish trap nets, which you can also use in getting. The snake trapped, but getting the trap using a net to trap mosquito to trap the uh, snake. Snake should not be killed, really. Under snake management, it should not be killed. It's a very big business in Chile and other country. The venom and venom is very very rich, so the snake should be protected as far as you are also protecting your life. Ne next is a uh, uh, last slide, please. The last slide. Uh, the last slide is now talking of provision of biodegradable snake repellent and anti-venom and venom in the facilities. If, even the, there was a time we had in venom. The first in venom disclosed in Nigeria was the cutting for a professor, a lecture, uh, uh, NTD staff. He took a live snake into a, a briefcase, then to UK, in a tropical medicine at uh, Liverpool. Uh, this is for tropical medicine. Then and also, now we now that is where they will develop polyvenom uh, vaccine that is now used for the snake uh, management in Nigeria. At the present, the snake uh, where I work in State Ministry of Health under NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, even in Federal Ministry of Health, we also uh, we have snake bite under neglected tropical disease. There's no venom, there's no anti venom. We have we have market type monovalent, and I will know the danger of administering. A monovalent vaccine to a, a monovalent uh, uh, case. Then finally, you will renal failure, kidney failure will be involved. So, in such conditions, a, a standard snake and venom, anti venom should be made available in such a facility, every facility to curtail that during flooding, after flooding, the post uh, flood disaster surveillance and response. There should be a level of containment in surveillance. There's a, a passive and active surveillance system that's going to be in, 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 in place 
to determine the level of uh, the level of uh, uh, outbreak. Different type of outbreak in different IDP may not IDP can may not be reported, but when it, when there's a post uh, standard post uh, uh, post flood disease surveillance and response, quick response and timely response are important. That would break. That would reduce the level of diseases, cholera outbreak, uh, scabies, and even snake uh, bites and reporting. We'll double know different about snakes that are still surviving in different environment. Because at this stage, the snake, the level of the type of snake which exists in places like Kosokoto and Benue, could also be finding itself in Baesa today, inside of mang the mangrove side now, because of the migraine of the last year flood. Even the state, the status of uh, of uh, Shisto, so masses, even the soil status in the state along the Niger Delta region cannot be determined at this time without any mapping or surveillance or any research, operational research. Food security and uh, nutrition. For food security and nutrition, one, if I, if I that at that stage, even at the moment, when the flood has come, storage material will not be there. There's no even facility to store the materials, to store any food. Meaning that the food is wiping off. For, there's no food for even the poor, the public conditions, the vulnerable children, even the adults. Then the food security will always recycle. My nutrition will come in place. We need also some persons again. If you get to some places whereby you don't have such chance, no person to cut up for them. The parents, maybe the children will be crying when the parents go out to go and look for food, even under the flood. When they come back, the children can even walk out. May there's a baby that walk out of uh, uh, the father's house when the father went to go and get food for the next island before he come and the baby was so floating in the river, the ground already. Food security. Just there was flood, just flood. And that is the major, is the major, those are negative impact we had at that time of the flooding. In fact, the, the most of the island, most of the environment were, was cut off. Food security, people are still suffering on that level of food security because the seasonal something, when you plant the cassava for this year, and it takes up to six, seven months or eight months to mature. Now, the flood receded from January last year. Now they are getting that. But this plan, annual, perennial flooding has come. People are like, like warning that. The Piranha flood might be more than last year on. They went ahead and destroyed their food, thinking that the flood will come again. Now the flood will not come to that level. There's no food. Food security in danger. People are already having malnourished condition. Now, environmental management and pollution, pollution control. They've said about snake, uh, mosquito repellent. Uh, it's biodegradable, biofriendly mosquito repellent. We should also go to a mosquito a snake bio, uh, uh, biodegradable uh, repellent that you can have around yourself, around your environment, that will not cause any havoc, havoc to your place. Every flood in after every flood in there's supposed to be pollu uh, pollution management control, fumigation in the homes, and if you biodegradable pollution pollution material, it should not be benzene benzene uh, backbone layer. You should be to follow biodegradable and bio friendly uh, repellent and environmental management system. And routine mass administration of medicine or shisto and soil transmitter helmet. We saw about the shimiasis, they're talking about other uh, drugs, but those drugs, are they really friendly? What does the adverse effect? Has it been tested? We can it stand the test of time? Is it economical? Is it economical viable? Those are things we are now looking at the NTDs, soil transmitted and shisto. They've tested uh, shistomiasis, practical for shistomiasis, and there are some countries where they don't have. They don't have even finance or do not for uh, pediatric system, uh, price quantile. That is the point. Now we're talking about leishmiasis for uh, uh, pediatrics. What else can they stand the test of time in some countries where you don't have good funding capacity to stand those uh, 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 pediatric standard? If the donor is not there, sustainability comes. Which country can stand that level of sustainability? So we need to come out with a drug that has the standard that can be administered in every standard of the sickness of that disease. Systemasis, yes, this drug, you can stand test of time. Be, be it upper layer, the lower layer, the children level, and the adults, pediatrics and that. Soil transmitted, yes, we have uh, we have that as Mabendazo and uh, and uh, Albendazo. So you have pediatrics, and that has been, that, that is standard test of time. So for this meiosis, we should look at also 
predict, if that predict is do, can you also stand adult standard? If adult standard, can they come into a pellet or tablet form that could go for children and adults? So that those are areas we're now looking at. There is routine mass administration of medicine. Less number of persons. In Nigeria, in Africa, before in Geneva, it was declared that uh, uh, we have level of uh, 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 volunteerism in Africa. But due to the economic standard now status, the, the level of volunteerism, <laughs> it's only, it's, you can hear it by word. People don't tell you, when you volunteer, I say, yes, won't I survive? Won't I eat my family? Somebody is volunteering. After volunteering, what are you keeping in mind to feed his family when he goes back to his home? That's level of So the spirit of volunteering in Africa, where they were standing before, is no more there to that point because of economic status of people. Those early days, people can feed themselves. They cannot have a leisure, a leisure time to go and volunteer. Even in the UK, when we're there, we volunteer. You see, have something to fall back to. But in Africa, yeah, the level of Africa, there's somebody to stand in that level of volunteering. Somebody in, in behind the screen who is there to sustain it, the volunteering point. So I can now sustain the point of somebody going to this Buddhist medicine freely and back. If somebody is not standing behind, or government is not standing behind, can they sustain that level of volunteerism? So coming, coming in between, the outsiders, those who are helping people, should be also be aware that this level of mass abstraction medicine, treating the children in different form, and not much standing the test of time again. Even mass abstraction medicine is standing, is helping. But it should be moderate. We should be outsiders, all of us should also be aware that the economy system is not friendly again to the world even to people who are doing the voluntary so with this i want to say thank you for being part of my audience thank you thank you very much dr toboy you are ntd program manager in Bayelsa state you've given us uh, quite a stark and sobering uh, account of what we've been talking about all day what does that mean climate impact on health and i think that was really very clear uh thank you so much for sharing that with us what has happened and what is still happening now in Bayelsa state uh, as a consequence of the flooding but also your thoughts and your first-hand experience in-field experience of what a partnership whether it be with repellent or or the therapeutic aspect, uh, or any other collaborations, what is needed for so many NTDs uh, in thinking of these major climate events and health. This is how the day started, uh, with a reminder by the World Meteorological Office, but also by WHO, climate change and climate events are the biggest threat to health of this century, and there is not a better example of that than what you've just told us about. So in that, we do hear the many, many calls for partnerships, and I'm sure that our audience and the other speakers, perhaps on the call as well, will be more than happy to take that on and work with you going forward. But thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an amazing session, honestly. I mean, the idea was to just broaden discussions a little bit beyond uh, purely climate and diseases and look at other sectors and other approaches and insight. And we've heard uh, so many different opportunities for partnerships and also to impact uh, somewhere along the line in this nexus between climate and health, whether that be on soil health, innovation in therapeutics, um, repellents, but also flooding management and environmental management. And now with your presentation, Leah, uh, mental health. Um, so that's been a, a great way to bring this day together, but at the same time also expand it to new horizons. And for that, we're very grateful. And uh, there's never enough time to cover everything we really want to say, but perhaps before we do, wrap up this day and wrap up this session, I'd like to ask our panelists um, just one question. We're a little bit over time already, but um, if everyone doesn't mind to put their camera back on, uh, I would just be curious to ask, coming from your perspective and all your very many different disciplines, 
and uh, solutions and approaches. Um, when it comes to climate and health, and we're talking about partnerships, um, moving forward, looking to the future, what would you like to see more of? Uh, we've heard a little bit of that from your presentations, but just on a very practical sense, um, what would be a great thing in terms of partnerships or whether that be more funding, just more exposure? Um, it could be anything, really. Don't all say more funding. Um, I'm all, always funding, like man. <laughs> um, well, if I can, if I if I can jump in, because I do have to leave to teach, but um, it, it's the morning here, so uh, uh, I would say, um, really, I think forums for interdisciplinary discussion, which can lead to interdisciplinary work. Now that might be obvious, but I think the the issue, Marianne, has been that we have these wonderful forums uh, and and um, conferences where everyone talks about all their different areas. But then um, after the conferences are over, everybody goes back to their silos. So I think one thing that needs to happen is um, that find, uh, almost like what they do in the business community, um, where they do networking beyond uh, the presentations where we can foster, we can actually foster collaborations uh, to solve to solve a problem. So today, for instance, you've got um, you know outstanding repellent work, um, outstanding uh, inter infrastructure, public health analysis, um, soil health, dr uh, drug therapy. So you got three or four. I mean, mental health issues. You've got three or four things happening at the same time, and just in this panel alone. What would be the next steps that we could get all of us together on on uh, a communal project that we can work together on, um, you know, that can solve a specific problem? So for me, that that's really the next step because um, these are wonderful talks. I listened to some of the earlier talks that you had, um, but then at the end of the day, everybody goes back to to their regular day job. So that would be my only my only thing. Um, and I see that with all these conferences. I've gone to so many conferences in the last year, and it's the same thing. Um, so this is not targeted at ISNTD. In fact, Marianne, thank you to you and your organization. It's led for it's led to me to have a, collabor a new collaborations that we're actually actively doing. So actually, you guys have been great. But I find that with all, all conferences around the world. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. That That's a great point. That's, uh, and you know, Thank you for the nice words you've said. Uh, I think you're also just that kind of person, Kishore. So I'm sure you will come out of this panel with another couple collaborations. So I don't know if it's us or if it's you, but thank you. Well, I'm giving and, I'm giving Dolly a hard time already on the on the chat. <laughs> he and oh, I talked last year, and, <laughs> and 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 his work has moved forward since last year. Amazing results. Yes. Um, and Amazing. we've moved, we've moved forward with uh, new results this year as well. So, you know, everyone's making progress. I mean, just using Dolly and I as examples, uh, everyone's making progress, um, but um, connecting everybody in a forum where it leads to actual an actual collaboration, I think is, is really what's needed. And by the way, that will then lead to additional funding because if you come with a, um, sure. with a multidisciplinary appl grant application, uh, which brings different forces, different uh, people together, um, that's attractive to the to the global funding community, I think. So anyway, I'll shut up now, but but thank you for the kind words. Uh, thank you so much. If you do have to run, uh, don't keep the students waiting. Uh, that's totally understandable. And just a massive thank you from us all for, for your words and for your thoughts. Uh, always learning something new. So thank you to you. Thank you to John Paul. And we, we will keep following your work. Okay, and, um, thank, and thank you again for the forum. And thank you, colleagues. I'm, I'm going to have to drop off. I've got yep. students. I've got to go uh, 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 try to convince them to, to, to do this kind of work. So uh, I better <laughs> practice what I preach. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Kishore. And uh, I suppose I'll ask the same question to Delali, to you. Yes. yes. So um, I'd like to build off what uh, Kish Kishore said. Um, so I think 
we need to try and put the pieces together after these conferences, right? Um, and that can be done through coll collaboration. Um, we've tried to work together with Kishore um, this past year, but I think we, I need to keep with the team pushing together uh, forward to make some of these collaborations um, um, feasible. Um, so I think the greatest ask that I have is to um, collaborate more after these conferences, try and piece mm -hmm. different pieces together and come up with a, like Kishore sure said, just to reiterate what he said, come up with a, com a common project or an objective to address some of these challenges that are that are here. So my, my key word is collaboration and putting the pieces together. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, we take note. <laughs> And we will be working on that. So thank well, you just very add, much. ISNTD has been an extreme um, supporter of such collaborations because um, post last year's conference, um, um, God rest his soul, um, Cameron put me in contact with um, Kishore and other collaborators, and we try to build off um, the conversation. So um, I think it's uh, it's an excellent uh, platform that you have here. And we should all uh, maximize its its use. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And it's uh, it's very easy to make collaborations between people that have such amazing projects and such uh, uh, amazing approaches to them, and a really collaborative mindset from the start. So, I send that right back to all our panelists. Dr. Taboe, so we've heard a lot from you and from Bayelsa State um, what's needed at the moment. But out of all of those things, what would be uh, the one thing that you would like to see more of? Uh, thank you. Um, um, it's a good one. I've heard so many. And really, actually, in, with that collaboration, it becomes a very, in the world today, we need program collaborations. We need program collaborations for we in the state. Just a good one, a quick one. There's what we call uh, 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 persons who normally go out for vaccine, local immunizers, immunization officers. We they they key in for HPV. We in entities also collaborate with them to make sure our medicine are distributed. We have what is called the system they have back in Nigeria called the house to house door to door mobile immunizers. We also key with them. They help us to distribute this abendazo and uh, metizan. So they, those persons are also kind of volunteers, which we work with. Because for entities, just like you said, there's we don't have much funding for that. So yeah. we key in with we we key on with them. But for uh, for the Shisto really, I'm sorry to ask me, in part of flood in the state today, which I'm really advocating for Shisto mapping and remapping of the, the canals, communities along the canals, or the creeks, high water flooding sites, and mainly the mapping for Shisto and the Mississippi. That is the point. If there could be form of collaboration, mapping, remapping of all water canals, those communities aligned and those areas. This because there are, they were two local governments, we call it district, that were endemic before. Because of this flooding, 2022 flooding, now you cannot identify which area that this area is this 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 system is highly endemic again mm -hmm. so you need now a mapping of these communities that is for the state then if that is done we can keep from there we're not going to publications at least you have to know the endemicity status of the place before you're not coming to any other step could go in the endemicity status should be understood and there are different condition of doing that which will now involve academias, which will involve the first of all in Nigeria, it must uh, be the but the, the aid unit in charge or the division in charge of the federal minister of health will be notified. She's told Nigeria, then key to the states, which I'm in charge of the states. We're going to the mapping. Mapping is the first thing first. And mapping involves laboratory activities, sampling, a sample, so, uh, so, uh, uh, sputum collection, sorry, so uh, 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 stool collection, blood, and that is about and urine 
to find about the uh, the endemicity status of system first. And that is the first thing we could need to achieve. And that of the snake, the snake condition is mainly advocacy wash to curtail yeah. that. That is the main thing because those are the two major things. Snake is so it's a it's a medical and emergency for snake and such a thing. I know in West Africa we lack in venom, anti venom. If we can also have persons who are there to donate that to Nigeria, even to West Africa and most of our states who are lying on the coastal region, highly open to flood, so snake uh, intrusion, snake that mainly anti venom. Those are two things I'm saying. But anyone stand better. But Sisto mapping is also very nice. If any person yeah. can come for us with that, then we're not going to because it will involve publications and so many things. In you know you know when you do mapping, so many things goes with it. Mapping is studying the samples and taking as a, then you now go to the standard of accepting the endemicity for treatment. Final after endemicity now you now if you start establish the prevalence. You cannot talk of treatment and continuous wash activity to mitigate. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's too. We were talking about concrete projects that we could all rally around and come together on. Those are two really precise and defined such projects. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I personally already have lots of ideas. <laughs> we can follow that up after the call. Um, and finally, for, for the final word of the conference, Leah. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that from my perspective, we don't have, uh, it, you know, a lack of ideas. That's not the problem. I think the, the problem is, yeah, mm -hmm. lack of funding for sure, but also lack of time dedicated to uh, fo following up. So, um, you know, you have a conference and so many people, their time is so valuable. They, they jet off to their families, to their classes, to their lectures, but having dedicated time that is really just meant to be uh, a time to collaborate and to talk about uh, uh, work in that kind of way. Um, I just think that, I mean, I have colleagues that I would want to work with on topics that we're, we, we're familiar with and, and we don't do it because we don't have the time to do it. So I think uh, really dedicating time for this is what what would be a minimum requirement where you have locked people in a room somewhere or something like where you just have that time set where you just kind of uh, talk about your ideas in a way that's more uh, uh, looking at collaboration. Wow, fantastic. That's such a simple and practical step. Just carve the time out to actually make this happen because you're right. Uh, I suppose forging new partnerships, as good as it sounds, does involve stepping out by definition of the normal, not routine, but the normal way of doing things. And that, um, yeah, that time has to be made. So it sounds like uh, our four panelists were all in agreement about this being one of the uh, sort of what they would really like to see much more of. And I'm sure that will reflect a lot of what the audience is thinking as well. So uh, thank you so much for leaving us with that very uh, proactive and concrete final step after this, what has been a, a really full day. I mean, lots. You were saying, Leah, that we're not short of ideas. Uh, that's true. A lot of tools out there, frameworks, uh, also building evidence base to link climate and diseases and particularly neglected tropical diseases, but also uh, lots of opportunities for more of that evidence base, particularly when it comes to neglected tropical diseases, particularly non-vector borne diseases. And even more so around all the um, uh, social and cultural issues around health and diseases that we may see uh, in in NTDs. So uh, a lot has been achieved, and we've learned a lot today. But still, the road ahead remains uh, quite uh, quite busy. So on that note, um, I would just like to give a final thank you to our audience. It's been an amazing day. Thank you for being with us for some or all of the sessions. Uh, and a final big thank you to the three speakers who remain on screen with us right now. And again, to all of those who have joined us throughout this very rich day. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
And uh, I hope to see everyone again next year. Um, but in the meantime, we'll keep running our weekly events. So please keep an eye out for those and join in as and when possible. And um, to our speakers, well, wishing you all the very best. We will be in touch. And thank you again so much for sharing your time with us today. We, we have run over, so it's even more appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for you having us. us. Uh, it was uh, a huge I'm very, pleasure. I'm very, I'm very, very grateful for being among the audience and also privileged to share my view and uh, also showcase our activities. At least so one or two persons are in the, uh, was in uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. And so I think you've had your friend who has come into the LinkedIn. We have so many activities. Today, really, uh, UNICEF, we went for a wash uh, IEC material uh, uh, acceptance and okay by the audience. I walked through three, two districts and uh, and uh, so many who organized uh, 10 literate and non-literate persons to identify the IEC material to be used for wash activities by uh, wash uh, advocacy and the sensitization, which UNICEF is showcasing, is managing. So today we're in the field today, we're in a different low district. Yesterday was a different district. We came together and we produced about 15 IC materials, which they, our audience will come back to, to the federal capital, Abuja, this evening, for which you self, you self sponsored that. Very, very fantastic. And we are always in the open uh, field. People do the activity we are doing. I published some of them in Facebook. We have been doing that. So it's a very open ground. It's a welcome environment. You can fly down to our airport, even to Potakot, the oil city. Uh, the Garden City, they call, and uh, by Esther, the Royal City. You can fly down and out at any time, even from there right from Great Britain. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, so every time I here. contact you, Dr. Taboy, you're always so busy uh, doing countless different initiatives. So um, I'm not surprised, but you've made time for us today, and that's much appreciated. Yeah. And we will be in touch, and please definitely do follow uh, the group's yeah. work on Facebook. It's very impressive. Thank you. All right. Well, on that note, thank you to everybody. All thank the best. You. I'm going to end the event now and uh, hoping to catch up with everyone very, very soon again. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you to our lovely thank audience. All right. Bye.